Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nathan at the European People's Party, and on behalf of the EPP, welcome to another episode of EPP Family Talks. Over the past several weeks, we've had the pleasure of speaking with leaders from throughout our political family about the ideas and projects they've been working on, especially during this period of coronavirus crisis. Today, it is our pleasure to welcome Yelena Drenjanin, Vice President of the EPP Group in the European Parliament, excuse me, Vice President of the EPP Group in the European Committee of the Regions, and Deputy Mayor of Huddinge in the Stockholm area of Sweden. So we are just trying to connect with her now. Uh, here, I think we've found her. So we should be connecting with... This is perfect if it works. Welcome to all of our viewers. It's great to have you with us especially to all of our friends at the European Committee of the Regions. Ms. Dereninen, welcome, Deputy Mayor. Nice Thank to you connect so with you. Thanks Thank you. for taking the time to speak with us today. The, the, first, the first question uh, we've asked all of our leaders in this EPP Family Talks interview series is basically just, how are you doing? How have you been adapting? How have you been spending your typical days now during this period of coronavirus crisis these past few months? Well, this has been a very, very different uh, period in all our lives. And I think no one of us have experienced anything like this. So as a politician, it's been very different because we are usually among people and with people and meetings and, and talking to citizens and so on. And that changed because we have been working from home or in my office by myself, but all the meetings have more or less been digital. So that has changed uh, a lot. So we had fewer meetings, shorter meetings, more effective meetings. But I would also say in the long run, I don't think it's good for democracy because it limits the time for discussion, different perspectives and so on. So, uh, in one way, uh, I think that we're going to learn to maybe have some meetings in the future, digital, but uh, meeting face to face is also important. My understanding is this uh, this platform, Instagram, is one that maybe you're you're being very brave on right now for the first time trying out with this. So we. Yeah, we this is actually my first time. We had uh, Skype meetings and Zoom and etc. Uh, but this is the first time I'm doing it on Instagram, so I'm learning still. Well, thanks. Thanks so much. For several of our leaders, it's been also their first time to do many of these kinds of things, especially on Instagram, so we appreciate it a lot. Well, my, my next question to you would be, just could you give us an update on what's happening in your, in your home country of Sweden? Yeah, well, Sweden have been uh, both uh, liked and unliked by different uh, politicians and countries. Did we do the right thing and so on? I think it's important to understand that every country look, has different culture, uh, has uh, different settings and so on. And uh, Swedish people travel a lot. So we could see that, that after the sport vacation in, in February, when Swedish people travel a lot, uh, go skiing and, and uh, travel all over the world. Uh, we are one of the richest countries in, in uh, Europe. That means also that our citizens can afford to travel a lot, they do. So they also got uh, home with the COVID. Uh, and we could see an explosion, especially in uh, Stockholm area, uh, because we have three regions uh, where we go on vacation uh, in February. And after the Stockholm week, when all the schools were closed, a lot of people were traveling and when they came back, uh, we could see an explosion in Stockholm. So Stockholm has been hit really hard. And I live in the Stockholm area in Huddinge, as the second largest municipality. So uh, Stockholm had to, to deal with this pretty fast. And then the second thing that happened in Sweden and, and uh, is that we have... <laughs> Also, we have a lot of, how should I say, our people live very long, uh, so they end up in elderly care. And we have a lot of elderly cares, uh, both private, but also uh, municipal ones. And uh, a lot of staff is working because it's 24 seven people are, are, are working there, coming and going, and they have also been traveling and have families and so on. So it's very, it's, um, one of the things we didn't prepare for or were prepared for were when uh, the, this, uh, the, this epidemic hit the elderly care. 
and these people are are vulnerable they're old they're weaker and so on so uh, that made also the death rates go up uh, extremely um, I don't know if all the other countries that we are compared to have the same numbers of elderly care as we do because uh, uh, we from the municipality we pay for them and you as a citizen you can choose if you want to go to private ones or municipal ones. Thanks very much for that analysis of what's happening in Sweden. I want to pick up on what you've just been mentioning with regards to the Stockholm area and your own city of of Huddinge to ask you a more locally uh, oriented question. I thought it was very interesting on the EPP group in the Committee of the Regions website to see recently they posted something called Fighting COVID-19 in Your Village, City and Region. And they go through lots of different areas and lots of different cities around Europe where our EPP family members are, are, are in government or are leading. Places like Bavaria, Tipperary, Sicily, Attica in Greece, cities like Sofia, Warsaw, Athens, Madrid, uh, and of course, your own city of Huddinge. So my question would be, what are some of the positive solutions that you and your team and your colleagues in Huddinge have put forward? Well, we quickly decided that we're going to follow the authorities' recommendation. And uh, what we also decided very fast was, we don't know how this is going to develop, and it's developing fast. So we decided that we are going to... Uh, change the way we work. Uh, people who can work from home can work from home. Uh, we also follow the instructions that uh, gymnasium students from 16 to 19 are going to have uh, school from home because everybody has a computer. Um, we also decided we made a decision in municipality because uh, uh, we have a lot of staff that we have the right to resend people. So if we miss people in elderly care, we can take somebody from a preschool and uh, decide that they should go and help out in elderly care. So we made those decisions. We also made decisions that we should just do the core uh, assignments for us as a municipality. Everything else is put aside. Uh, and we made that decision early in the process because we were all agreeing that we have to, to do our core assignments as a municipality. And that is taking care of all elderly, and that is uh, the garbage or the daycare and uh, the school. And we didn't shut down our schools. Uh, I'm glad we didn't, uh, even if we had uh, a lot of staff being away. But we also had kids uh, that didn't come, so it made up equally. So we, we made it in that way. But, but I think that we early decided to do what is most important. Everything else can wait. It sounds like really the two most important takeaways, let's say, that you've learned from, from this pandemic is first relying on expertise and then also getting the priority straight. So yeah. for the prioritization. Um, so something I guess every city, every region could learn, every government can learn from. My, my next question would be more at the EU level. Of course, at the, at the EU level across the European Union, COVID-19 has resulted in the loss of over 132,000 lives and, and severe economic contraction, lots of job losses. When you look at the EU response over these past three or four months, what would you see as the greatest, let's say, uh, the, the things the EU has gotten right, the, the, the ways the EU has really been there and met the challenge? And then what would you say are the next steps, the next concrete steps that you should be taking? I, I think that in a way, this crisis had something that taught us that we have been naive uh, when a lot of our core industries have moved out to other parts of the world because we, we were missing uh, some medical equipment and uh, I think that uh, in the EU, we decided that we should uh, ease up the borders. Uh, we helped each other with patients. Uh, we opened up borders for food or, or, or medical assistance and so on. So I would say that uh, in a way, it was good for us also to see that we need each other no nation can do this alone. We need each other when it's hard. And if you look at how European Union has grown, it has grown from, from after the Second World War when all Europe was uh, in ruins. 
Now, this is a different kind of war, but it's like a war situation. And we see that we need each other. No one is uh, strong alone. So I think that uh, all the things that we were planning for in the next period of time, we're going to do faster and better maybe. And uh, I think also that we learned that we need to have a lot of core businesses and industries in Europe. So maybe the next steps, the next concrete steps could really focus on trying to make sure some of those core industries, strategic industries are. Absolutely, are absolutely. I think we have in one way uh, been a little naive. Uh, I think also that uh, things are going to change about the, in some countries we have seen some nationalistic uh, wins and so on. Everything that's going to change, I think, because uh, uh, this is going to change Europe, it's going to change the world, it's going to change our behaviors. And uh, we that are in politics, we know all the things that we have been working for for many years now with structural change. For instance, the Green Deal is nothing we came up with now. The Green Deal was something we have been working on for, for, for years. Uh, now we're going to have to speed up things. Same thing with digitalization. I've been talking about it a lot. Digitalization is not just buying the machines. We also need the people to be uh, well educated so we can lead this. And if we compare Europe to China and India, we haven't had the same force on the same speed as they had in educating their people to follow this. And now 5G is coming. 5G is going to change everything so fast. If we are not on that train or that plane or that jet or whatever you call it, we are in trouble. So I think, um, like Churchill said, don't waste a good crisis. I think good things can come out of this. And together with all these fantastic countries, we have talented people, we have exceptional uh, research companies. We can do great things together. Thanks so much for those ideas and for the, the inspirational uh, element there as well, the, the optimism there. I wanna ask you now a party political question and also come back down to the local level. When you look at the EPP family in, in the context of this crisis, maybe starting with your own body, the body that you're a vice president of, the EPP group in the European Committee of the Regions, how have you seen the EPP family showing leadership? I think EPP uh, family always shows leadership and we also have, uh, I think, a culture of discussion, of debating uh, and uh, trust in the citizens. Uh, and I think that all political solutions that we have, we have to have together with the citizens and we have the trust in the ability of citizens, not doing things for the citizens, doing things with the citizens. That's a big, big difference from the EPP family. Uh, because if you compare to maybe left sides, they are talking to the citizens like parents to children. I would say the EPP family, we talk to people as people, how we're going to solve this together. And we have faith in each other. And I think that's very important because our citizens uh, know what's best for them. And I think everybody's afraid of change. But when you have accepted that fear is a part of change, then it's not so scary. Well, we want to finish on, on the note of personal connection. We want to finish by asking you a more informal, uh, more personal question to help our viewers and our political family get to know you better, maybe even a couple of questions. Before I do it, I would also just on the note of EPP family and leadership uh, greet again all of our viewers in particular a special welcome to a member of the European Parliament Maria Spiraki from Nea Democrati, our party in Greece. So the, uh, the next question I would ask you is, is there a historical figure whom you have found particularly inspirational or helpful to consider in, well you mentioned Churchill, so maybe he would be somebody coming to mind, but anybody else whom you might mention, uh, you know, especially in these last few months that, that you've considered as being particularly helpful? Well, I think as a political leader, it's always easy to be popular when times are good. But uh, for me, role models are the ones that have these goals uh, and the, the strength to do changes that are necessary. So I would have to say Margaret Thatcher, because uh, 
she she was strong and she did uh, necessary things that uh, Britain gained from in the long run and changed Britain to become what it became. Now they want to leave in Brexit, so who knows? But I admire her because she was strong in her beliefs and uh, she performed what she has to perform. And I think it's important if you are a political leader or other leaderships that you have to, to um, trust uh, your belief and go for it. You're not going to be popular, but uh, you have to have faith and you have to be strong and not so sensitive because there are always people going to complain and uh, you're always going to have your enemies and, and so on. But if you think of uh, changing the world to a better place and in the long run, uh, you have a perspective that this will gain all the citizens and your country or Europe, you go for it. Uh, and uh, it's good to like yourself, I think, in those moments because it's not easy to, to uh, do changes, especially when everything looks dark, as it did when she uh, started out. And what about a book or a film or a series, which maybe you've recently well, captured and would everybody recommend? Everybody who knows me knows that I'm, I'm very interested in gender equality. Uh, in the European uh, Council, I'm a spokesperson for gender issues. I was a rapporteur in the Committee of Regions on trafficking. So I have this book. It's called She Said. It's in uh, mirror image, uh, so... But, okay, it's yeah. a, she said it's a winner of the Pulitzer Prize, and it's about breaking the sexual harassment story that helped ignite the movement, and it's about how uh, many years of work to uh, reveal uh, Weinstein from Hollywood, you know, but also how Me Too movement, uh, thanks to social media a lot, things uh, would not have happened if it wasn't for social media uh, and so on. And uh, this book was very interesting because it also shows how corrupt some political systems are and uh, also how everybody has a, a role to play. But if you are silent and uh, not speaking up, you are also contributing that uh, these things are happening. So I would really recommend this book because I think it's very uh, adequate in these days. Well, thank you so much for that recommendation and for those insights. I have one final question, a very, very impersonal, uh, or sorry, a very informal sort of a fun question. And that is my understanding is that on your Instagram profile, you also describe yourself as a fashionista. Yeah. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about what this means to you? I love fashion, but as an art, but also as an economic uh, movement. Did you know that after the Second World War, the Marshall Plan did a lot for Italy? So the Ital Italian fashion industry got technology from America. So they took old stuff. Uh, design, history, material, and they took new technology, and that made Italy in the 50s, they took America with storm on ready-to-wear collections. So I have, I have studied everything that my daughter has studied at uh, Stockholm University uh, in fashion history. Uh, it has a great impact, uh, and it also shows that uh, Sometimes uh, we think men are, are, are in charge of many things, but actually when it's to purchase and so on, uh, women have, have a big impact on what is purchased or not. So uh, I like it as an art. Uh, I like it as history, economic, but also part of identity. You can express yourself. And uh, I like the, the, how should I say, the handcraft of a beautiful, uh, thing that hasn't been made. Fascinating. Uh, I would love to hear more of your, you know, opinions and your ideas, what you've learned uh, about this at some point. But thank you for this and for all of the ideas you've shared with us and for your time. Yelena Derenyanin, Vice President of the EPP Group in the European Community of the Regions and Deputy Mayor of Huddinge in the Stockholm area. On behalf of the EPP, thanks for the great work you're doing and for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. Have a nice day, all. Bye. You too. Thanks. Thanks Bye. to all of our viewers.
please join us again next time tomorrow afternoon at 6 p.m. on Facebook. We'll be speaking live with Dr. Andrei Kovacev from the European Parliament, Vice Chair of the EPP Group in the European Parliament. Have a great afternoon and see you then. Thank you.